This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded presentations of former U.S. intelligence officers and historians who have captured their um, amazing activities. Uh, today, I'm welcoming back um, a guest who was on our program a few weeks ago uh, named Vince Houghton. Uh, Vince has a master's degree and a PhD from Maryland University. He served with the U.S. Army in the uh, Balkans for a time. You may uh, recall him as being the curator of the International Spy Museum. And much more recently, he has become the director of the National Cryptologic Museum. Um, Vince, welcome back to AFIO Now. Good to be back, Tim. Thanks. Um, Vince, as you know, is an author and has written a number of books. Uh, we had him on the program a few weeks ago, and David Priest interviewed him about his book entitled Nuking the Moon. Today, we're going to be talking about another book entitled The Nuclear Spies. Um, Vince, you know, there are a lot of books uh, about U.S. intelligence um, and about uh, both the German and the Soviet nuclear programs. Um, why did you think that another book on this uh, subject would be of interest to the public? Why, that's the magic question that I've been asked over and over again about, hey, aren't there enough books about this stuff? And, and there are. I mean, there's, there's dozens of books about the American effort to determine what the Germans were up to during World War II when it came to atomic weapons. And there are dozens, if not hundreds of books about the American effort to focus on the Soviets in the early Cold War period. But what's interesting about this, and, and while I was reading through them, I knew I wanted to do something on nuclear intelligence of the early period. And I, and I always say I've read all these books, and I said, none of them, none of them deal with both, right? I mean, they, they're, they're either one or the other, right? And so there's, they, they, historians seem to have created an artificial, what I would consider an artificial line of demarcation between the Second World War and the Cold War that doesn't exist in real life, right? You know, historians go back and chunk things into eras, and it's very easy to do through hindsight. But at the time... It was somewhat seamless that the, the, the operations of American intelligence to discover what the Germans were up to flowed directly into the operations to figure out what the Soviets were up to. And so we've applied this artificial line of demarcation. So there's books written about one or the other, or in one case, Jeff Richelson, formerly of the late Jeff Richelson, formerly of the National Security Archive, wrote a book called Spying on the Bomb, where he had a chapter on the American effort against the Germans and a chapter on the American effort against the Soviets, and doesn't combine or connect the two. And, and I argue that you have to. That, that the only way to really understand why we failed so miserably in determining when the Soviets would have their first atomic bomb, you have to understand the German effort. You have to understand what happened years before it. Not only is it the same personnel, not only is it within the same decade, but also the lessons learned or not learned from the effort against the Germans go directly into how we approached the intelligence question of when would the Soviets get the bomb. And so I, I found that people had kind of been missing the boat, they were saying, you know, by looking at them independently and separately, it, it made it almost impossible to understand. And, and so we kind of threw a lot of really, I would say, incomplete answers at the question of how did the Soviets surprise us so badly? And there are bits and pieces here and there and it just didn't tell the whole picture. And I wanted to tell the whole picture. And, and, you know, I'm trying to be humble about this. I think I did. Right. I, and I think that we got a lot farther with this book than we have before because of the integration of what happened just a couple years earlier in the American effort against the Germans during World War II. Vince, as you know so well, um, writing about intelligence is um, really very challenging. Um, a lot of classifications involved. Um, not a rich amount of source material available. And then you add to it uh, the nuclear topic, which also at the time was also very highly classified. Um, was this particularly difficult for you to research? You said at the time was highly classified. You'd be surprised it's still highly classified when you talk about the, the building of the atomic bomb. There are letters from the 1940s that we still can't get our hands on. Uh, and, and of course, intelligence professionals don't write documents for historians, right? I mean, they're they're writing it for policymakers. They're writing them for kind of a cover your ass perspective. Or sometimes they're, you know, worst case scenario for a historian is they're writing them as disinformation as a way to deceive anyone who finds them later on. And so I had to take all this into account. And then again, like you mentioned, when you bring the nuclear element into it, it makes it incredibly difficult. 
So how did I get around this? Well, I, I, I swore to myself, and, and at the time, I swore to my dissertation director that I would do everything I could at the end of this project to say, I looked at everything I possibly could in order to put this together. And that meant I exhausted every resource when I, a little, it's a little bit like a detective work where you get a primary source document and a primary source document that may actually contradict one another, whether it's about dates or whether it's about places or other things. But then you can bring in memoirs of the people who lived during this time period. And memoirs, of course, we take with a pound of salt because they're usually written with a bent or they're written with a perspective. But then you can bring in oral interviews. Some of the guys who worked on this program in the 1940s have done great oral interviews, places like the American Institute of Physics, which is in College Park. You can still, you can find those online where they're talking about this. And then you have to worry about does memory match up with reality. And so in certain cases, I actually had to say in the book, I have no idea what date this was on. Because this document says one date, this document says another date, this guy says one thing, and they're all talking about the same thing, but on different days. But it's not like it's months apart. It's not like it's dramatically different. Uh, most of the time, it's just they wrote a wrong or recollection was a little off. But for the most part, when you're talking about the big questions I was trying to reach, I think we've got plenty. I think we've got enough from congressional records, from primary source documents that have been declassified, um, declassified multiple times. Right? They were originally declassified with redactions, and then since then, redactions have been declassified. So we know a lot more now than we ever did before. Um, I was also able to get certain things declassified that were I just ignored, and that's just one of the great ways I knew that I was really the only one working on this program, uh, because there were article, there were there were documents that were in microfilm from the nineteen seventies. They were put on microfilm that from the nineteen seventies, and they were classified, but no one had asked for them to become declassified in the now almost fifty years since the time they were classified originally. So that was a nice little hint that no one else was working on this program, this project. Uh, but it was also something where. It didn't take me very long to get that stuff declassified. So like, oh, yeah, this is way, way beyond, you know, the need for any kind of secrecy. Uh, and I was able to see some things that others hadn't. Uh, so is it complete? Absolutely not. I'll, I'll be the first one to say, honestly, in 20 years, we may be able to, to write the sequel to this and add some interesting information that comes out once certain atomic bomb related information is declassified or certain early CIA stuff is declassified that's still, you know, we're talking about sources and methods. Of course, we all know that will stay classified for a long time. Do I think when this happens, it's going to change the big premise of the book? Absolutely not. I think that, you know, the shoulders I've stood on based on everyone else who's written about this and the access to information that we finally do have now, I think that we, I have. Um, and I argue we have now a very good understanding of why one program failed and the other one succeeded so well. Vince, you alerted, uh, alluded to this briefly in your uh, first remarks, but it may make sense for our viewers to step back and talk just a little bit about the history of the Alsace program and then whether uh, there were lessons learned that were applied from this success uh, to efforts to penetrate the nuclear uh, program in the Soviet Union. Well, the, the sad answer is no, um, not very many. Um, for those that don't know, the Alsace mission uh, was, well, Alsace itself, the name, it, you know, like many other names, it was thought to be random, right? You know, the idea of the Pentagon gives you a list of, of code names, you get to pick one that the randomly generated names. In this case, the Alsace mission was not randomly generated. Alsace actually is the Greek word for grove, like a grove of trees. And someone at the Pentagon thought it was cute to name it, that because Leslie Groves was the you know the head of the Manhattan Project, but also the head of the All Souls Mission. He wasn't particularly happy when he found out that someone had kind of created this homage to him. But at that point, changing the name would have drawn more attention to the program than it was worth. So the All Souls Mission continued on. And essentially, what this was is a group of counterintelligence professionals and scientists who followed the very front of the war against Germany. Uh, in some cases, taking sniper fire, in some cases, actually getting ahead of the American and allied forces uh, to their chagrin. Uh, they sometimes moved faster than they should have and ended up in places that hadn't been cleared by the allied military in an effort to reach German scientists, scientific institutions, laboratories, stockpiles of atomic material to see how far along the Germans were 
when it came to the production of the atomic bomb. You had to do it on site. It was a way to find out absolutely with all certainty where they were. What's interesting about this and what other people haven't argued is that the Alsos mission achieves their goal by the end of 1944. So by December of 1944, they get to a area called Strasbourg, which depending on your lineage and what side of the wall you're, you grew up on, Strasbourg is either in Eastern France or in Western Germany. It's been passed back and forth about a dozen times over the centuries. But Strasbourg was where a major German atomic bomb laboratory was. Now, major, this is not Los Alamos, right? This is not Hanford, Washington. This is not Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Major for what the Germans were doing, which were doing, they're building an, an atomic pile, which is kind of the early way of saying an atomic reactor to try to create plutonium. They were doing their research there. The also mission captures it and finds out in December of 1944 that the Germans are nowhere near building an atomic bomb. They are at least two years behind the West. They are at the place that Enrico Fermi at the University of Chicago was in the summer of 1942. This should have been the end of the Alsace mission. This should have been great. You've accomplished the mission was to find out how close the Germans were to the bomb. They had accomplished that mission. So why don't they all come home? They don't actually. They, for almost another year, they continue their operations. And this is something that people just glossed over. Historians just said, oh, well, they just kind of kept going to make sure they had it. No, it was done. Why did they keep going? Because the priority had shifted at that point from the Germans to the Soviets. Almost overnight, Leslie Groves and others said, well, we know the Germans aren't going to get the bomb, but we have to do everything we possibly can to make sure the Soviets won't get the bomb and can get slowed down and we can find out what they're doing. So the Alsace mission continued into Germany in order to capture German scientists, in order to capture German nuclear facilities and materials so that they wouldn't get into the hands of the Soviets. And in some cases, this was going behind enemy lines. In some cases, this was almost an attempt to rejigger the territories that the French, British, and Americans would have after the war. I mean, you think of the French area and the German area, the British area and the American area in, in Western Germany. We almost changed those in an effort to prevent nuclear material from falling into the hands of the Soviets. That's a longer story that you can certainly read about. So this was a real mission, a real operation that had the Soviets as their target. Unfortunately, when the war ends, so does all sauce. Uh, people pushed for a continuation of it. There are memorandum, and there are a lot of them from people like Leslie Groves, from some of the top scientists, from some of the top scientific personnel going up even to the White House, that this should be a permanent institution, that you should have this unit within American intelligence that focused on other countries developing the atomic bomb. I mean, obviously, the Soviets were the prime target at that point, but this was not just for the Soviet question. This was for everything. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. Like everything else, uh, at the end of World War II, it was demobilized. Um, like the OSS, like you know, the U.S. Army and everyone else, the, the war was over. We could move on to happier times. And so there was a lag. There was a time period in which no one was really thinking about this in an organized way. There are bits and pieces of information coming in about the Soviet program, Signals intelligence operations in Europe were bringing in hints that the Soviets were working on things. There were um, continuations of what we call the scientific underground, which were scientists throughout Europe who were passing information around, at first from behind enemy lines in World War II, from German-occupied Europe, and then later on from Eastern Europe, when they got wind of anything that was going on inside the Soviet Union. But the Soviets were so good at counterintelligence that very little information leaked out. And because the United States was not organized in any way, shape, or form, any of that information that did leak out or any coordinated effort or any possible way to find out what was happening inside the Soviet Union was lost. And in fact, the, the, the CIA, which was arguably created to prevent another Pearl Harbor, a nuclear Pearl Harbor in this case, doesn't stand up its own Office of Scientific Intelligence until right before the Soviets detonated their first atomic bomb. I'm talking like months before, in 1949. So the, the gap between Alsace standing down and OSI standing up, really that lost time that we really potentially, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I hate counterfactual history, so I will never say we would have figured it out. 
I will never say it would have solved all our problems. Because who the hell knows? But that time period is really lost between 45 and 49, where we essentially dissolve all of our capabilities of doing scientific intelligence at the highest levels. And it's no surprise to me that the Soviets caught us with their pants down. Vince, uh, did U.S. intelligence and U.S. senior officials significantly underestimate the Soviets? And if so, why? Well, I mean, that's, that's really the foundation of the book. I mean, that the idea is, is why did we... I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel about how we could have discovered what they were up to. I mean, that, again, counterfactual history, it makes it very hard to do. But I am trying to explain why we let ourselves be in that position. And we let ourselves be in that position for two reasons. And I think this is, again, why it's so important to look at the German experience versus the Soviet experience. We had so drastically overestimated the German scientific capabilities during World War II. We had assumed that they were way ahead of the Americans. We assumed they were going to have the bomb at least a year before we did. That We assumed that they walked on water in many respects. I mean, if you think about the names that come out of the Manhattan Project, that are all household names today, whether it's Oppenheimer or Fermi or Glenn Seaborg or Richard Feynman and all these others, they weren't household names in the 1940s. No, no one had, you know, these guys as their heroes. No, it was the baseball players and it was the, you know, the actors and the politicians, much in the same way it is today. Well, now we know all these guys and we know all these guys because of the atomic bomb. What's interesting is the guys still back in Germany are the household names everyone knew. The Werner Heisenbergs of the world, the Hans Geiger, you know, you know the name Geiger Counter. Otto Hahn, who actually discovered artificial radioactive, you know, the ability to create artificial fission back in 1938. And, you know, these are the guys who actually taught all the Americans in grad school, Max Planck's of the world and the Max Born's of the world who created quantum mechanics. These are all the ones that were in Europe. These are the guys that were probably going to be in charge of any kind of German atomic bomb. And Werner Heisenberg was at the level of Albert Einstein and arguably more important to Albert Einstein for most of our day-to-day -day living. Einstein looked at big, huge, atomical events, black holes and, and speed of light and stuff. Heisenberg looked at subatomic particles, quantum mechanics, which means our ability to turn on lights and have this conversation over this computer right now is because of Werner Heisenberg more than it is Albert Einstein. And Heisenberg was the Oppenheimer of the German atomic bomb program. So we were terrified that the Germans were gonna beat us to the bomb. Then, of course, we find out they were nowhere near building a bomb. And this had a lot more to do with infrastructure and our ability to fight a war overseas. So we're not fighting it on American soil. Uh, we could spend a lot of money in building three cities, Los Alamos, Hanford, and, and Oak Ridge. And we could put billions of dollars into this program where the Germans couldn't. So we have that lesson we learned that even the Germans, right, the greatest scientists in the world, could not build an atomic bomb in the same rate that we could. Now, if you take the, that perspective and look at the Soviets, for decades, the Soviets had been considered backward when it came to science. And not just a little bit backward, but significantly backward when it came to science. No one thought the Soviets had good scientists, even though they had helped to invent genetics, even though they had done a lot of things that today we would say, my God, you know, the Soviets really knew what they were doing. Sputnik, Yuri Gagarin, you know, all these innovations that come later on were eye-opening to us because we assumed the Soviets were idiots when it came to science. There, there's, there's a lot of quotes uh, in the book that are just overwhelmingly nearsighted when it comes to the, 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 the American analysis of Soviet scientific capabilities. The idea is, you know, their most capable technological production was the two-seated farm tractor during the Second World War. I don't know why they're ignoring the T-34, but that's fine. Um, and, you know, the scientists were bumpkins. The scientists were idiots. There's no way that they could come close to building this bomb. And so we underestimated that aspect of their capabilities. We also underestimated their production capabilities. We knew how much it took to build an atomic bomb. We knew how much money it took, how many resources it took, how many scientific brains we had to bring together to do it. And so Leslie Groves, for one, said that Soviets aren't going to build a bomb for 20 years because they just could not bring together the output. They couldn't bring together the industrial might to build the bomb. 
he even said he kind of half jokingly said, well, unless they shut down the rest of their economy, there's no way they can build it. Well, in fact, they shut down the rest of their economy and they're able to build the bomb much faster than we thought. And then there's a third group. So, you know, people thinking and understanding the Soviets for different reasons. One, scientists are idiots. Two, the industrial production just can't keep up. And the third thing was a system of government argument. For people like Van Ever Bush, who was the chief scientist for the United States during World War II, um, argued along with others that the Soviet system would not allow them to do innovative science. That the kind of communist, rigid, totalitarian system would prevent them from taking the chances that the Manhattan Project scientists were allowed to take. Van Ever Bush wrote a book called Modern Arms and Free Men right before the Soviets detonated the first atomic bomb, basically making this exact argument, saying much like the Germans, who were authoritarian and, and had a rigid governmental system, the Soviets would just not be able to be creative enough to solve some of the problems they would run into when it comes to atomic weapons. All these things taken together, and going to make a long, long story short, all these things taken together gave us a false sense of security. And it made us think that we had a lot more time than we actually did. And so people weren't ignoring the problem. They understood how dangerous it would be if the Soviets had the bomb. But they said, you know what? We have time to get our infrastructure in place. We have time to create the bureaucracy, like the Office of Scientific Intelligence. We don't have to rush that in in 1946 or 1947. No, we can come around to it in 1949. Because the CIA consistently had been saying the earliest possible date for a Soviet bomb was 1951, and the most probable date was 1953. In fact, the Office of Reports and Estimates, which was the, which was the group within CIA who was putting out these estimates, in September of 1949, put out an estimate that said the earliest possible date was 1951, and the most probable date was 1953. Now, why is that important? That was in September of 1949. The Soviets had detonated their first atomic bomb a month earlier in August of 1949. So the CIA was still putting out this nonsense estimate a month after the Soviets had detonated their bomb that they weren't going to get a bomb until 1943. That's how bad we were at figuring this thing out. It's one of the trends in U.S. intelligence uh, post-World War II and particularly post-9-11 has been the greater uh, centralization of the U.S. intelligence community. You seem to imply in your book um, that actually greater central centralization was one of the reasons for success during World War II against the uh, Germans. Yeah, I mean, it was ultimate reason for success. And I think this is something that you would never see today. I think we saw it because of the, the kind of the desperation we felt during the war. One person was given full control of American atomic intelligence. That was Leslie Groves, during the, you know, who was already working on the atomic bomb. So he was the perfect guy to be in charge of atomic intelligence elsewhere. And there's a whole chapter in this book, I believe it's one of the longest chapters, that's just step-by-step step of Grove centralizing this and, and consolidating this power under his command. And at, the, at that point, he was the guy, which, you know, had some problems. Certainly when you micromanage as much as Leslie Groves like to, things probably went a little slower than they might have otherwise. But it was a clearinghouse for information. Right, Every piece of information that came in about the German atomic bomb program went to Leslie Groves. He was able to figure out where the gaps in intelligence were and try to fill those gaps. He was given assurance by Bill Donovan at OSS that anything he needed, he would get. So when there are gaps in intelligence, he could call on Donovan to send someone in to find out what was going on. And, I, and, and most people will ask the question about Mo Berg, which I assume you probably have on there somewhere. Uh, that's certainly what happens with Berg. When the Alsace mission couldn't get to the, the Italian scientists because Rome had not yet fallen to the Allies, you know, the, most people, you know, kind of ignore the Italian campaign, uh, but it got stuck, right? You know, it got stuck for months uh, before Rome finally falls. And that wasn't good enough for Leslie Gross. He needed somebody in Rome before Rome fell. And that's where he was able to call on the OSS to help him out. That allows this program to be successful. I mean, I think that there's, there's no way to, to come to a different conclusion about that. The, the systemized consolidation of power means that Alsace is successful in World War II. Now, I'm not going to tread into the counterfactual, like I said, and saying that if we had a consolidated, centralized intelligence apparatus in the early Cold War, we would have discovered what the Soviets were up to. I cannot make that claim. 
I can make the claim that we were not in any position whatsoever to take advantage of anything that came in from the Soviet side because we didn't have a centralized system. So I can't say that we would have succeeded with one, but we sure as hell were set up for failure because we didn't have one to begin with. You um, mentioned Mo Berg, and you're right. I did have a question about Mo Berg in my hip pocket. For our viewers who are not familiar with Mo Berg, uh, he was a Jewish American from uh, New York. Um, who played Major League Baseball for 15 seasons for four major uh, American uh, League uh, teams. But he was a very, very unusual ball player. He had degrees from Princeton University and Columbia University. He actually had a law degree. He spoke a number of foreign languages. He went on several trips on behalf of Major League Baseball to uh, Japan before the war and actually took pictures of downtown Tokyo that were shared um, uh, with Army intelligence. Uh, but then uh, he was actually sent on several missions to Europe as part of the Alsace mission, um, the most important one of which was to find Fermi, and the other was to interview Heisenberg to try to make that determination whether or not the Germans were close to a bomb. So a long intro, but my question is, so OSS had some really interesting, talented amateurs like Mo Berg, were there any Mobergs after World War II and after uh, OSS? Well, I mean, the answer to this question, you just look at Moberg himself. I mean, we don't need to go beyond other Mobergs. And, and I think that one of the reasons that you don't get the same kind of success that you did during the Second World War is a, exactly what keeps Moberg from being a career CIA officer, uh, is that the free-flowing, no-rules, oh-so-social OSS uh, that worked great during wartime. That worked, you know, when you had the ability to to kind of freelance, when you had the ability to make stuff up and do it on your own, assume that Bill Donovan was going to have your back if you were successful. That didn't work in the CIA, even the early CIA, where you know the agency was trying to figure out what it was doing. Uh, things were codified. Things were bureaucratic. Things, it was all of a sudden a government organization. The one great advantage of everyone just kind of poo-pooing the OSS and not wanting anything to do with it, was that Donovan could do whatever the hell he wanted to. Uh, and so his officers could do whatever the hell they wanted to. I mean, Mo Berg made up his own stuff. He got travel orders. He got a, essentially a mission. What's very interesting is the OSS, ironically, was, was set up a lot more like the German army than the American army. Uh, the German army had a concept in the 1930s they had developed called Ostrachtik, which essentially means mission orders. Uh, and what German junior officers were given wasn't a step-by-step -step way to accomplish their mission. It was the end point. They said, we need you to be at place X at the end of the day tomorrow. We need you to ca capture this hill. And the junior officers were actually able to figure out how to do it, right? They, they were given the end point, and they were able to kind of figure out how they were going to get there. The American Army today, that sounds familiar to anyone who was in the Army during the Cold War, because we stole all those ideas, the American doctrine during the Cold War was exactly that. Well, it wasn't that way during World War II. So the more formal, rigid U.S. Army didn't like the way OSS did things. And OSS actually was kind of stealing ideas from the Germans. Well, you can't do that under CIA. I mean, as much as people have written about the freewheeling CIA of the 1950s, it still had a top-down bureaucracy. It still all went to Alan Dulles, who was micromanaging where people were in the field. You know, there was Kim Roosevelt moving around you know, uh, the Middle East or other places, it still was a bureaucracy. And that's what kept Mo Berg from staying at CIA. It was just too rigid for him. It, it was too formal. So I think you do have an early CIA that crushes this type of personality where they just can't get have a normal government job. Uh, and so you don't necessarily have the free-flowing personalities that you would find at OSS. That being said, you also have the problem of the Soviet counterintelligence just, just at this point killing us. Uh, and that's, you know, you could say, well, you know, the Gestapo was no you know, walk in the park. But the Gestapo hadn't completely uh, invaded uh, or uh, infiltrated British and American intelligence at that time. You know, so anyone we tried to send in, Kim Philby told them about, or the other Cambridge Five told them about, or George Blake told them about, 
or any of the number of people who were working for the Soviets in the United States before Venona was decrypted. The Germans didn't have that. They didn't know when anyone was landing. I mean, Kim Philby told them everything. So there was no opportunity to send in a Moberg type person into the Soviet side because they would have been snatched up. In many cases, they probably were. And some, some of those things are still classified about some of the, 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 the damage that was done by the Kim Philbys of the world. For um, our CIA members um, who have a chance to go to the CIA museum, Moberg's baseball card is the only baseball card on display at the CIA museum. Vince, I want to thank you very much. Of course. Once again, uh, uh, a great journey back into the past to learn some things that um, I wish we had learned a little earlier. I appreciate your coming on today. Look forward to having you back soon in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on again. For those that have read Nuki in the Moon, this is a little different in tone than that book. Uh, this is a much more straightforward history, but I think it, it, it really has some lessons for today uh, when it comes to our inability to take seriously potential threats from other places because we have some kind of ethnic bias or some kind of underlying belief that we're better at doing things than others. I think that's you know one of the interesting reasons that we've been surprised so many times by other countries developing nuclear weapons because we thought they couldn't do it because they were, let's say, North Korean or Iranian or anybody else. Uh, this is not a new idea. All right? This is a new idea that goes back decades and decades and decades, but it's one that we certainly haven't learned the lesson from. Uh, and I didn't write this as a political science book. It's a history book, but certainly it's something that, that I think has been insightful for people to, to look at our current world today and say, well, maybe we shouldn't be so sure and how we believe someone's capabilities are. Because, you know, atomic weapons is, is kind of as convoluted as they might be for a lot of people aren't that complicated. And certainly they're not that complicated to anyone who is a scientist. Um, figured it out in the 1930s and 40s. They can figure it out today. I don't care where they are or who they are. Uh, it's something that we should take more seriously than we do. Well, thanks again. All the best to you. Look forward to having you back soon. Thank you so much.